Welcome to Not Your Normal Hockey Show. I'm Julie Robenheimer. And I'm Brian Hedger, and this is episode one. The one about the draft. We have so much to talk about. Both Brian and I were in Nashville for the draft. I am still in Nashville, and um, I have a plane to catch. So we're going to get into this as fast as we can. So 45 minutes, Brian, we're holding you to it. Yes. Well, that was like, I, I, that's my preference, 45 minutes, you know? Yes, except you talk too much. So we're going to implement some timers today. So let's get into it. Let's start first with some winners of the draft. Who do you think went home a winner? Whether that be a team, a player, myself for all the good food I ate in Nashville, yourself for all the barbecue you ate, whatever it is. What are your winners? I didn't eat that much barbecue, but it was I was definitely a winner. Like, I'm always a winner when I leave Nashville uh, because of the barbecue. Rippies, that's the place to go. Jax isn't bad either. Okay, so winners, let's start off here. Uh, we'll start off right at the top. Um, I'll, I'll do the, the predictable thing, and I'll, pre I'll just go with the Blue Jackets as a winner uh, in this draft in that uh, they, got, they, they came into this draft needing a franchise – kind of pillar number one center type guy. And they think they feel like they got that guy in Adam Fantilli who uh, most draft experts, I think, including yourself uh, thought would go number two to the Anaheim ducks. And he did not go to number two to the Anaheim ducks. And uh, the blue jackets basically rushed up there and, and uh, called out Adam Fantilli's name. So he is now a blue jacket and Yarmo Kekalainen And after the draft, the GM of the blue Jackets said, that uh, he thinks he's NHL ready, and uh, he's going to tell Adam Fantilli that when he gets a chance to sit down and talk to him, you know, more in depth. And they're already like basically carving out a roster spot for him right away in Columbus next year. I think Columbus Blue Jackets are a winner for getting Adam Fantilli. I agree, fully support it. Nice. Who else you got? Um. Oh, we're going. I thought we were going to go. Okay. All right. I'm going to go with another one. I'm going to go. Another Blue Jackets one, but this but this one's more fun. I'm going to go with Tyler Peddle's family. Okay, so Tyler Peddle is became the last pick in the NHL draft. So he is quote unquote like Mr. Irrelevant. Um, he plans on not being Mr. Irrelevant. Uh, at so you know making that that pick worth it. Uh, this is a kid, and you were there as well. You know about you know all about Tyler Peddle, but he sat there all day. Um, on the day two of the draft at Bridgestone Arena, said he didn't move from his seat. Everyone, every, someone asked him, like, didn't you go up and go to the bathroom or like, get, you know, get concessions? Or no, I did not move from my seat because uh, he was a, he thought he'd get drafted at any moment. And it's getting down to the very end, the very last pick, and he's thinking in his head, like, well, who knows? I, I don't think I'm going to get picked. But you never know. And then they announce a trade, the Blue Jackets trade, and they end up getting the seventh pick or that uh, that last pick in the seventh round, and they pick him. So I'm picking Tyler Peddle's family because Tyler Peddle came to the draft with 12 family members, and they live in uh, Newfoundland and also uh, Nova Scotia. And they all flew down to support Tyler Peddle, uh, just hope hope to see him get drafted. And it took the literally the entire draft for them to hear his name. So at the end, when they get when they all let out a big huge cheer, and it was just it was a fun moment on the draft floor. But like they were the winners for that for for um, uh, waiting it out and sticking it out. I agree. Yeah. I love it. As somebody who's who's participated in events in which family members come to support you. Um, it can be very like personally devastating if you feel like you didn't fulfill like your end of the deal. Um, so I love that for him. I love that for his family. I love his comments afterwards where he was like, all I needed was a chance. Now I have the chance and now it's up to me to prove that, that they were right in taking a chance on me. And the crazy part is, is he was the second overall selection in the QMJHL draft two years ago. Oh, that's so, two years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like he has a lot of uh, potential. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, obviously he's fallen and, and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, 
the the team that he plays for in the queue has been through some things this year. And three coaches uh, this past year alone, I think, right? Three coaches in one year, one one season, um, a GM change, uh, you know, players leaving because of the situation. So there's a lot of turmoil within the roster. So uh, I'll be very curious to, to watch him and watch this team uh, this coming year to see if anything changes with that. But it's obvious that he's got, you know, some, some good tools to work with um, because a lot of uh, scouts um, and draft rankings had him much, much higher than the 224 that he was selected. So, um, yeah, good on him, good on his family, good on the Blue Jackets. Um, so, yeah, a another winner that I have is the Flyers. I think the Flyers crushed this draft. Like, mm. they did such a good job. I think, personally, I feel like any team that went home with Matt B. Mishkov was just, in my opinion, an automatic winner. And I do feel, I've said this multiple times on multiple platforms, I do feel that the hockey community has been done a disservice by the situation that's going on in Russia and, and obviously the impact it's had on the world, but also the impact it's had on the hockey community and us not being really able to watch any of these players. And this is one of the best uh, draft classes for Russia in years so much good talent. And so when you've got all of that, um, and then you have Matt B. Mishkov, you know, leading the way, he 1000% could have challenged Connor Bedard for the number one overall pick. And not even just like Adam Fantilli challenged, but like legitimately challenged him if he had had the opportunity to really showcase on an international stage. He's, he's never really played this season or even most of last season against his peers. It's always been against men. And so that always kind of waters down an opinion because he's not being used in the best situations. He doesn't get as much ice time. He's not given the puck. Uh, so there's a lot of things. And, and you look at it and be like, oh, he's, he's not making that big of an impact at the men's level. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reason why I was curious to see Connor Bedard at the men's world championship this year, to see what kind of an impact he could have on the men's level um, at that point. But, you know, we won't have to wait long for that. Let's, let's be honest. So um, anyways, I, I feel like the Flyers went home a winner with Matt B. Mishkov, an incredible talent. Um, and the fun part is a, a lot of people obviously want to talk about uh, character flaws. That was a big issue heading into the draft that he would drop because of character flaws. And, um, and he might have actually, because like, well, it's not just the character flaw. I, I think the whole drop thing is, is like he would have gone higher for a lot of different reasons, but mainly the one you just talked about. So is that a, just a situation of him just not wanting to go to those places? Well, no, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, they, he, he, I, there Brian, were... you're missing the point. The point is, is that he could have, uh, um, you know, had bad, bad interviews or declined interviews as the case mostly Which he was. Did. What the Blue Jackets were one of them. Because he didn't want to go there. Right. And so here's the thing. A lot of right. European players want to play literally on the East Coast. And a lot of that has to do with the ease of actually getting to the East Coast not only for their own travel purposes, but for their families to come over and visit. It's just super convenient. So there's that issue of it. There's also wanting a fit, you know, with the uh, organization's philosophies and what they're looking for and the style of play that they want to play. So it was interesting in hearing these theories mm -hmm. and on how a player can control where they go. And I feel like if anyone could have had the manipulative uh, wherewithal to do that, it's a player as smart as Mavi Mishkov to be like, I don't really want to go to wherever. So I don't really want to, you know what? Here's the thing, Mr. Hedger, <laughs> with your timer. I like I the timer, okay? But I didn't interrupt you. So, no, I want you, but I want you to, though. That's the thing. No, I don't. I don't. I want to allow you the opportunity to, to say your piece. I want to see the timer. 
I'm done with you. So now the thing with Mishkov is in talking to him and in talking to him through a translator at the U18 World Championships, his personality is exactly the same. So when people came to me and said he has character issues, I was like, hmm, that's surprising because I didn't notice that at the U18s, which was the only time that I had the opportunity to talk to him in 2021 when he was a 16-year-old. I didn't get that impression from his teammates who absolutely loved him at the U18 World Championship. So like, where is actually this information coming from? So now that I'm hearing like this kind of like manipulative tactic with the uh, interviews, I believe that more than I believe the rumors of his character flaws um, over in the KHL right now. So anyways, I think he's a big winner. Um, and I think the Flyers are a big winner. Um, I also think the Flyers are a big winner just for the number of picks that they went home with and the quality of picks that they had. Um, so I would say uh, that that is, is my biggest winner. I have some other ones, but I'm going to talk about them later. Do you have any other winners? I do. Um, you know, I, I, you, and just really quick, you could build on a point with the East Coast thing. Um, Montreal was sitting at, at right there as well, and they they did not take Mishkoff. And I, I was told that they that neither them nor. Um, but again, along with your point though, Arizona is another West Coast team, and they like they. I heard that they they wanted nothing to do with Mishkoff anyway. So I think it was a little bit of the a little column A and a little column B, and he goes down to the Flyers. But what I will say so. Uh, I'm not going to go with a winner here. I'm going to go with a loser. Loser. Are we done with winners? Well, I thought we could just kind of alternate back and forth. We want, All right. We want it's your show, one. Brian. Whatever you want. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm controlling this whole thing. I'm so weird. Don't take it personally, Washington Capitals, but you are the loser. And we're also kind of or, – and because we're building off what Julie was just talking about here. And it is – I'm pretty sure the Washington Capitals were hoping – that the Philadelphia Flyers would pass on Matt Vigmishkov and let him get to them. Cause that was the big rumor. It was like, Hey, maybe we can get Mishkoff at eight. And like, I mean, the, the Flyers being a big, I agree with you. They are a big winner getting Matt Vigmishkov and his talent with the seventh overall pick. I mean, that's pretty, that's, that's getting it done. It really, really would have been, um, exacerbated not exacerbated it would have been it would have been even more so a winner if he had fallen to the capitals and he goes and plays you know uh with the capitals he takes over for ovechkin or whatever the whole storyline would have been perfect but it didn't happen so naturally that makes them a loser by default naturally yeah although i would and it, you know it, it, since we're doing winners losers really quick i'm gonna add a winner and it'll also be the Washington Capitals. They also won because they got Ryan Leonard. And I thought that I think that he's going to be a really good player. I think I'm sure you have thoughts on him as well. He's like a he's not as tall as Matthew Kachuk, but he kind of plays that that, you know, physical in your face game, uh, which a lot of coaches and general managers or anything, they love that kind of stuff. He can, he can get it done offensively as well. So loser Capitals, but also a winner. Well, I love Ryan Leonard. Uh, I love his game. I love his personality. Um, so I think, yeah, I I'm down for that. I also, I mean, there's a lot of, if we're talking like winners based on the actual just player that they did, uh, that they did go home with. Um, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, there's honestly, this, this draft was so good that like the entire top 10 are quality hockey players and almost locks to not only make it to the NHL, but to be impactful players in the NHL. Like we're going to talk about this draft class in a decade and, yeah. and like how utterly good it is. Any other given year, Adam Fantelli would be number one pick, you know, talked about forever. I don't know sure. that Leo Carlson would be number one pick. <laughs> oh, Truthfully. You're killing me. You're killing me. Well, I, as don't much as I like Leo, Leo and He's as much as guy. I like his game, mm -hmm. I cannot get past his skating style. He mm -hmm. skates like a freaking Clydesdale. So he just like plods along mm -hmm. and has this short, choppy stride. And oftentimes I feel like he's skating in quicksand. 
Hmm. So, like... He's actually skating on ice, just FYI. But it looks like he's skating on quicksand. But it's actually so, ice. As talented as he is, as smart as he is, as um, much skill as he has, like, it is really hard to be that bona fide franchise guy if you can't skate, if mm -hmm. you can't keep up. And now here's the thing. I say all of that. Like, I don't think he's a bad skater, right? Everything is relative, okay? Mm -hmm. He's mediocre, you know? Like, he can get where he needs to go. It definitely doesn't look pretty. And it looks like he's putting out, like, a massive amount of effort to get there. So, mm -hmm. like... From a durability standpoint, like how many quality minutes can he actually give you if he's skating like that? Like those are the things that I'm thinking of. Now, mind you, he did play at the Men's World Championship, he played a ton of minutes, um, was used in a lot of good situations, and he wasn't like overly impressive. But, you know, for an uh, you know underage player, a junior player, he played really, really well. So, you know, that lends itself to him. And the other thing, too, is I sit there and I say, like, maybe as a centerman, he doesn't really have to skate all that much. But I no, feel like he does. Have to skate a lot of right? Stuff. Like, but this is where I'm like, I'm like, how, how, how do you, how do you, I, like, it just, it doesn't compute to me. And so that is the only thing that really gives me pause. Because the two things that I always look at, are your compete and your character. And then beyond that, it is your sense and your skating. I feel like you can improve your skills, you know, like your puck handling skills, your shooting yeah. skills, stuff like that. It is you it, it, like your, your hockey sense, your smarts is very difficult to learn. Right. Especially yeah, like at this point, it has to be innate. It has to be right. um, second nature to you. And then mm -hmm. with your skating, how many people like drastically improve their skating? And at this point, how have you not already done that? So those are the things that I am concerned about um, before anything else. And so the fact that the, you know, Leo definitely has the compete. He definitely has the character. He definitely has the smarts, but it's that skating that has me concerned, especially with like where the NHL is going. Like if you're not fast, you're, you're legitimately dead in the water. So we'll see how that turns out. So so in my mind, I guess I'm going with Anaheim as a loser for passing wow. on Adam Fantilli wow. because I just don't know how you do that. Now, mind you, I've watched Adam a lot this year, more so than I've seen Leo. I've seen Leo at World Juniors and at the World Championships. Um, I've seen Adam at the World Championships, at World Juniors, and also throughout the season with Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. And I just feel like he is such a complete player, such a package. I truly, like, I, I don't know how you – the thing with, with um, Adam Fantilli is he is eights across the board, right? He's not exceptional in any one character uh, – in one mm -hmm. uh, – um, what's the word I'm looking for? In Category. One, thank you. So – you're welcome. He's not he's not a nine in anything. Right. But he is an eight across the board and is like super, super solid. So I just love what he brings to the table. And I cannot overstate his character. Like he is incredible. He could be the captain of the Columbus Blue Jackets someday. Like he and it and it, it, uh, like I don't know. This guy has to get in line behind Cole Sillinger, but anyway, it could be, it could be sooner than later. I, I, I like honestly, he is just an A plus human being. A plus cannot be understated, and I think that is a large reason why he won the Hobie Baker Award. Because what a lot of people don't know is that the Hobie Baker Award has a very large uh, character and leadership component to it. So it's not just what you're doing on the ice and, and in the locker room and how your teammates like you and stuff like that, but it's like community service and your involvement and your leadership as well. And I truly believe that that is what really pushed him over the edge. Because when you look at Matthew Nyes and Logan Cooley and, you know, all the other guys that were in consideration for the Hobie Baker, um, th like the talent for the Hobie was very deep. And I think his character really pushed him over the edge because Again, not that the other guys are lacking in character. They certainly are not. But Adam is just like 
so exceptional in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Big win. Big win for Columbus. So I'm going to also pick another winner here, and I'm going to pick the uh, Anaheim Ducks. Go ahead. I'm going to pick the Anaheim Ducks, and I'm going to directly con uh, you know, go right after everything you just said there um, <laughs> with my opinions. Uh, I love Leo Carlson as a as a prospect, and I'm. I don't pretty, hate him. No, no. This love, so, and I'm pretty sure that the Blue Jackets love them too, and I think that we know the Ducks love them because they took them. Yarmo Kekalainen, the GM of the Blue Jackets, told us uh, first of all when he talked about Adam Fantilli after they took him, um, he said all the right things. Uh, you know, if you if you were to read the things that Yarmo said, you know, in my story or or you know, just uh, from the transcription of his interview that I, I wrote down, you'd be like, "Wow, they love this guy. This is amazing. That he's going to play in the NHL." But if you're standing there listening to him talk. He sounded like somebody who just lost his dog in the woods and the dog's never coming back. You know, like he was not, a, he couldn't be any less excited if you asked him to be any less excited. I mean, he eventually worked himself up a little bit to, you know, kind of talk it up. I mean, there were phrasing in there that were like, yeah, I guess he's a character guy and everything, you know, and like, like, like I mean, it was literally that kind of stuff. And, I mean, just things jumped out at me like they did not want to take Adam Fantilli, or at least he did. And he also admitted that uh, on Wednesday morning, uh, the Blue Jackets did contact Pat Verbeek uh, to say, hey, like, what's it going to take? You know, like, what, what's the price tag for moving up? Can we flip-flop spots here? And Verbeek basically said nothing. Like, we're staying here. And they, he didn't tell him we're taking Leo Carlson because I don't think that they knew who they were actually going to, like, fully going to take. But I think they had a sneaking suspicion it was going to be Leo Carlson, and they wanted Leo Carlson. And then they were like, we can't get up there now, and they're going to take him. Um, and so, like, you know, whew, it, you know, it wouldn't make sense to try and trade up. Yarmo also loved Will Smith. That needs to be put out there as well. We, like, um, he had been watching him a lot. So did Billy Siren, their director of uh, amateur scouting. They'd watched Will Smith. They really liked him a lot as well. Um, and I, I've been told that there, there was some discussion there as well. Like when, when it was Will Smith and Adam Fantilli, there was like discussion going on. I mean, it, that's what I've been told anyway. There was discussions going on about like who, which one should we take? And, you know, Fantilli ended up winning out, obviously, because they took him. Um, Carlson, the, the, here's the thing with him. If his skating, as you say, is just average, right? Or mediocre or whatever. I think that can be good enough because the other stuff in his game is outstanding. Like, and you mentioned that, like he, he thinks the game well, he's got great hands. If you watch his highlights, his hands are ridiculous. His vision is ridiculous. So I think that he can adapt those skills and those abilities to, to make it, you know, like to overcome whatever skating issues he may have, if he's able to like protect the puck, how many times have we seen in the NHL that a guy can't protect the puck? I think he can use his body and shield guys off and he's always got his head on a swivel and he's looking for Pat. He makes ridiculous passes. Um, and I think he's got a better shot than people give him credit for. He needs to use it more. And he even admitted that at the combine, like I need to use my shot more. I, you know, coaches tell me that. Um, I think he's going to be an outstanding player. And, like, when I think about who the Blue Jackets were trying to trade up to get, when you really start logically thinking about it, it was 100% Leo Carlson because it wouldn't make any sense to be, like, it, like if they thought that Fantilli was going to go one and they really wanted Fantilli, I guess you could you could make the argument, oh, well, they're trying to get, trade up and get him. But if you're the Ducks and you know that you're going to, you're taking Carlson and you, and you get a call from Yarmo and he's like, I want the second pick. If you're Verbeek, you're thinking like, well, if he wants Fantilli, if the, if you really think he wants Fantilli, you're going to take a deal. You're going to be like, we are moving down, baby. They're coming up to get Fantilli and we're going to get our guy at three anyway. And we're going to get something from Yarmo. This is awesome. They knew the jackets wanted Carlson and they were like, we are not moving. It's not happening. We're not moving. You're not getting Carlson. Like, away with you, you know. And so, I and I think that that's why they wanted to move up because you didn't have to move up to get Will Smith. 
right? Like, and nothing against Will Smith. Uh, he was going to be there at three or even, well, he ended up going four, but he was going to be there. Um, and so it was between Fantilli and Carlson in that tier of the draft. And I think that they for sure wanted to move up and get in Carlson if they could. Carlson, um, he played number one center at the World uh, Championships, as you mentioned. And a huge reason for that was because of Joseph Bumidian, who is the director of pro scouting for uh, the Blue Jackets. And he is assistant GM for Sweden. He knows Leo Carlson inside and out, like from all those aspects you talked about. And I think that, you know, I think he was pushing, uh, I know for, for a fact he was pushing, but I think they wanted him. And uh, so I, I think the Ducks are winners. I'm not going to say the Blue Jackets. I already picked the Blue Jackets as winners as well, uh, getting uh, Adam Fantilli for all the reasons you stated. Um, I will say with Fantilli, my only concern with him, and I'll wrap this up because I'm rambling here, but, like, my only concern with Adam Fantilli is – it's, I'm not going to call it a character thing. You already said he was a great character guy and the leader and all that stuff. Um, he got listen. Booted. Don't let your Sparty colors show. No, no. But listen, he Michigan Michigan State is a big rivalry. Even though Michigan has dominated it, however many years, like five years running, uh, Michigan State, as you know, the program is sort of like on the rebound here with um, uh, you know the the new coaching staff, Adam Nightingale. Adam Nightingale, yeah. Yes, all those guys. Um, so they were they they really gave Michigan like a all they could bargain for surprisingly last year. But it's a big rivalry game. Admittedly, the Michigan State guy hits Adam Fantilli late. Uh, it was not a good hit. I didn't like it. But Fantilli gets run out of that game for his reaction to it. And and to me, I'm like, well, that tells me he's thin skinned because you got to start thinking like this is a big game, and now you're out of the game. You're the best player in the on the ice, and you're out of the game. That's one game. And you're like, okay, it's an isolated incident. I'm like, okay, it's an isolated incident. Then he goes to the world championships and he gets, he gets booted out of one of those games. I think like either get, he got booted or a 10 minute misconduct or something. There was some kind of like thing that racked up his penalty. Minute. He had like, I think he had over 40 penalty minutes in like seven games. And so I started to have these concerns of like, just being a little too thin skinned. I think he needs to have, he needs to be a little more thick skinned and just realize like, my team needs me to stay in this game, not in the penalty box, not getting booted out of here. Um, I, I mean, I do. you do want him to stand up for himself, but you also don't want a guy who's going to go absolutely crazy. So, know? okay, let's reel it in. He didn't go absolutely crazy. He went but absolutely crazy I, in the Michigan State game. What I will say is I don't necessarily think it's thin-skinned. I think it's um, learning how to – fill that role on the team. And by that role, I mean being the the guy, being the go-to player and understanding that in order to contribute the most to your team, you need to play within your game. That is not his game. No. You know, it is not. But when, you know, emotions are on the line and, and um, you know, you want to step up. Sometimes you do things that are out of, you know, character out of your wheelhouse. And I think the better judge of that is um, how he played towards the end of the season and how he uh, utilized those moments, you know, when they were down in the frozen four, when they, you know, went to uh, overtime, um, against Penn State, you know, like in, in the ways he stepped up there. Uh, I think that's all a learning process. You know, he is still just 18. Um, so there's there's all of those uh, things that go into it. And then even at the men's world championship, again, like he's just trying to like step into a men's level and saying, OK, is this, you know, th it's part of the feeling out process of like, where is the line? What can I do? How can I best utilize my skill? Do I need to step up in this way? Um, so I think both of those instances are learning experiences more so than they are uh, pointing to his character. Okay. Um, I do have one more winner that I want winner. to say before we have to wrap up the segment. And that is the Columbus social team because they freaking killed it. I loved just about everything that they put out this week. And uh, I, I, like they were so prepared. So 
props to Lauren in the CBJ social team who was in charge of uh, all of the uh, digital content that went out this week. She crushed it. Her team crushed it. Uh, I loved the when Carlson went number two. Literally when Carlson went number two, the entire arena was like, what just happened? Right. <laughs> no, like, and it was like I mean, silent. I knew, I knew it was going like, to. I, I almost feel like there was an audible gasp. It was like, oh, what? You know? I, well, and, me, I had a feeling he was going to. So it was one of those things where they had a photo at the ready and it was like, you know, the little eyeball emojis, you know what that means. And <laughs> um, literally, I think it was a huge win. And again, for the Michigan Blue Jackets, I think it's exceptional. Yeah, it will. I think we're, I, I, in my article today, one of my many articles I've had to write here in the last one, I think I, I, I made the petition uh, that they, they need to change the nickname to the Maize and Blue Jackets. Oh, I love that. There you go. The, the Columbus Maize and Blue Jackets. I'm sure all the blue, uh, Ohio State. No, the Michigan Maize and Blue Jackets and the, yeah. and the Michigan Blue Jackets. There you go. Um, you know, and it should be noted that, that Lauren on the social team for the Blue Jackets, a recent hire, um, she's a, a recent grad of the University of Michigan as well. So she's another Michigan. So she Michigan. loves it. Yeah, yeah. She's, in, she's in the mix. And the other thing, too, is um, they had that uh, post-it note, Adam Fantilli um, from uh, draft day. Um, no matter what, Adam Fantilli, no matter what. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. You, you okay. know, Fantilli, Fantilli actually had told them, uh, and they had the video of this. Basically, there was one of the interviews they did. It may have been at the combine. He, I don't know if it was a slip up or what in his, you know, cause you're supposed to be so political, but he basically said that he, he thinks that he thought that Columbus would have been the best fit for him. Like he was, he's basically saying, I think it could be a great fit or one of the best fits, if not the best or something like that. And yeah, then they have that and then they used it, you know, so. Pretty I agree. Cool. It's a big yeah. win. Big, yep. big win. All right. We have 20 minutes. Exactly. We're, we're wrapping it up at 45. We have five we, minutes. We have, we have 20 minutes left from when we started recording, Brian. You talked a lot oh. before we started recording. Oh, you're going to edit. That's right. You can edit. You're such a good editor, Julie. <laughs> You are. So we have uh, 20 minutes left of the show. Now we're down to 19 to talk about our memorable moments. I have quite a few, and it starts before the draft. Hang on, I'm trying to. I'm I'm trying to help you out here. I don't need a. I don't need a whistle. That was a car horn. I don't need that either. The the number one moment for me was Kyle Davidson's man on the street interview before the draft. Oh, I missed this. I missed Are you this. kidding me? I, oh Julie, I, was so, I was so freaking busy this weekend. Oh. I, was, I didn't have any fun. I had little fun. You know what I had fun? I had fun eating ribs uh, with you and Bailey Johnson there at, at Rippy's, and that was my only fun for the whole time. Okay. Well, let me – uh, I'm, I'm going to pull it up, and uh, we'll show the audience in case the audience is just like you and living under a rock. Yes. So – a nice rock though oh what's your name and where are you from uh kyle from chicago from chicago yeah <laughs> yeah Have you ever been to Nashville uh, a couple times yeah for, for a black ox uh yeah all right on a scale of one to ten one being not a lot and ten being a whole lot how much would you say you know about hockey probably like i didn't i didn't play professionally or anything so probably like a four. Oh wow oh, okay. god Fan of the sport, I don't know. Some people say I don't know that much, so okay. <laughs> uh, oh, Wayne Gretzky, time. Mario Lemieux, um, Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, <laughs> Dunk Keith, Brett Seabrook, Corey Crawford, Nicholas Jalmerson, Johnny Oduya, uh, Michael Rosevall, Brian Bickle, Dave Boland, uh, Nick Felino, Taylor Hall. Andreas Athens to see you. Uh, Connor Murphy, Seth Jones. Anytime. That was great. I, 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 there were some good names in there. Brian Bickle and uh, what was that? Roosevelt? Was that in there? Yeah, big Hawks fan. Yeah, most of the uh, 2020, 2010 or 2013 Chicago Blackhawks. Were you watching that team? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. So one, uh, what is one change you would make to the NHL right now? Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty awesome. I don't really have a, a specific change. I love, I love the game. Love where it's at. Love the, uh, love the players that are in the game. And it's, yeah, it's all good to me. An honest question: 
do you think that the league rigged the draft in favor of the Chicago Blackhawks? No. You should have said yes. Pretty confident. That would have been I'm fair. very confident. Okay. All right. There we go. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was really good. So this interview happened. He was just walking down the street with somebody else. I don't remember who. He mentioned it in his interview uh, mm -hmm. after the first round. Um, and uh, he was originally asked to, to do it. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. And then the, the conversation between him and the other guy he was with, whose name I presently forget. Um, wait, 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 another, wait. Another scout, another GM. Yeah, they didn't know. They did not know that he was the GM of the Chicago Blackhawks. No, no come on. And they did That's, not know. I don't and, that for a second. And so they, so he, so he's like, "Oh, do you want to do it?" And um, he's like, "No, no." They left. They started talking about it. He's like, "You know what? I'm gonna go back." So he went back to them right. and had to wait because they were interviewing two other Hawks fans. Uh huh. And the, those two other Hawks fans didn't recognize him either. Of course and not. so then he did the interview and oh then he mentioned after the first round, of course, a lot of the GMs talk and especially he talked as, you know, the holder of the first overall pick. Right. And um, he said, uh, yeah, he's like, after the interview was over, you know, I told him who I was <laughs> and they were like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Um, but honestly, like that video was gold. Absolutely. Where'd you, where'd you find that one? Where'd you dig that one up? Are you a regular subscriber to whatever that? No, was? it was all over hockey Twitter. I truly okay. don't know how you missed it. Well, because I wasn't really, I wasn't, I honestly wasn't paying attention to it. Was, well, it was all over hockey Twitter. Like I could fairness, probably go back and tell you how many yeah. views that video has, uh -huh. and it's it's got to be like pff, quarter of a million. In in fairness, and, I, and I need to, you know what? I, I'm going to finish this segment with a, well, I don't want to call them a big fat loser because they get so insensitive about everything. They're, they at least fix the situation. But every year at the draft, when you show up, the wireless is a mess. And it's like, it's, it doesn't work very well. And so I, because of that, I was like, I was completely out of the loop on Twitter stuff. I wasn't surfing the, you know, my timeline because I couldn't. I literally couldn't get on Twitter in the first round of the draft. Now, they, the NHL did fix this for day two, and they put in, like, LAN hookups and everything, which was just mwah, chef's kiss. So loser on day one, winner. They, they turn it around, and they're winner on game two. But I'm hoping next year for the draft – in Vegas, of all places, that is where it's at, right? So. No, I think everyone's just speculating that it's there. Oh, I, see, I heard that too. I heard, I heard people <laughs> like, oh, well, you know, because next like, year. how do you follow up Nashville? You go to yeah. Vegas. Next in fact, I was having, Vegas. I was having a conversation with a scout last night, and and we were saying he's like, maybe you should just always like alternate Vegas and Nashville. And I was like, maybe they should int introduce the, the Canada rule for World Juniors, where it's there every other year. So every other year it should be in Nashville and Vegas, and then every other year it can rotate around the league. You know, just to be fair, but like. Nashville and Vegas. So, anyways, Brian, that video has over 6.7 million views. Well, it wasn't viewed even one time by me until just now. Yes. So, so yeah, 1.7 million views, 17,000 likes as of this moment. Wow. 26,000 uh, 2600 retweets. Yeah, you've been living under a rock, bud. Sorry. Wait a minute. Go go back over those numbers really quick. How many views? 6.7 million. And how many likes? 17.8 thousand. That they can only get 17.8 thousand likes out of 6 million views? What's going on? Yeah. That means well, that I think it's because a lot of people like showed it twice. It over and over. Yeah, yeah, watched it over and over or like showed their friends. And, you know, like you can't physically like this on my phone right now. So No, no. But you would oh, if you were way. watching it on your own. All right. Well, I'm, I'm we got to wrap it up now because you took too long on this segment. So some of my other um, likes, my memorable moments, were Adam Fantilli's jacket and vest. Oh, a yeah. freaking plus. That vest was epic. Like, I hadn't heard the story beforehand. The Michigan Daily did put it out uh, before the draft even started that this is what he was wearing. So kudos to the Michigan Daily. Um, but it has uh, 
hundreds of people's names, family members or families um, that collectively helped him and has every teammate at the University of Michigan um, on his jacket. I'm going to post the picture here for those of you that are also living under a rock and miss that. I also still love uh, Arizona's uh, matching suits for their management. I just think it's a sharp look. I, I love like the uniform nature of it. I think it's a good, interesting color. It's not black. It's not gray. It's not navy, which are all the go-to colors. Uh, I'm a big fan of Finland. Usually at the men's world championship, all of right. the men's national team members wear this like beautiful, like, and it is a stunningly beautiful shade of blue suit that, you know, I I want, I want a blazer. So all the women within the national team also get to wear one. And I'm like, I'm super jealous. I want that You're jacket. Jealous. Yeah, you want so the jacket. love Arizona's matching suits. You can like make fun of them all you want, but they're looking sharp. Um, Carrie Price, forgetting Ryan Bacher's name. And and uh, what say what you want about the moment. And also say what you want about the pick. Okay, here's a loser. The Montreal fans, absolute L for them. Wow. Like the Why? way they are, the way they are treating Reinbacher right now is absurd. Absolutely wow. absurd. Who do they want? Who do they want? Uh, anybody. They like they were they were really they wanted Mishkov, um, but they they are they are literally ready to burn the city down because they picked David Reinbacher. Until Reinbacher so, comes in there and he's good. He's going to be like, exceptional. Yeah. He's another one who was at the men's world championship. Now, granted, he's playing for Austria at the men's world championship, but he had a tremendous performance. He sure. is going to be a great. He, he is by play. far the best defenseman in this in this draft, and it's like not even close. He's right. he's Montreal fans. You are going to regret this behavior that you are displaying to him right now. So actually, they won't because they're Montreal fans. Knock it off. Not you, Brian, but the Montreal fans. No. I know, but I'm just saying that they won't because we know how they act. So I loved their, uh, I loved the way Carey Price handled it. His tweet afterwards, he's like, well, that was embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it was so endearing, you know, and it was part of those things. I don't know if he forgot the name or if he like maybe wasn't sure about the pronunciation like in that moment and just wanted to double check. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it was unfortunate that it happened, but how it was handled was very sweet. Um, a couple other things. Keith Jones thanking the Washington Capitals for drafting him. Um, he is such a schmoozer by nature, you know, like just always super personable and and um, loves, uh, you know, building relationships and, and communicating well and, and fun. So I thought that was fun. And along the same lines. Bill Guerin thanking Tootsies for keeping everyone well hydrated in Nashville this week. That was well done. That yeah, was well done. it yeah. really was. And the funny part is, is, you know, I'm up early, so, and I'm staying right by Broadway. So I will often go for a run or go for a morning walk or whatever the case may be. And you see Broadway and literally every morning it's uh, trucks delivering more beer or more alcohol or more oh, yeah. whatever. It's so Tootsies. it's, yeah, re restocking from from last night, um, yeah. and so I kind of made the joke because the one time it was where the NHL awards party was at, and uh, there were three <laughs> alcohol related deliveries wow. in that moment when I was right there for them. I was like, "Well, that's on trend," you know. <laughs> um, so some other things on my list: uh, no trades of significance. That's a loser for me. Not necessarily a memorable moment. That's a loser for me. Okay. Like, not only were there no trades in the first round since 2007, like not mm -hmm. a single trade, nothing, nope. zero, zilch, nada, not a move up, not a, you know, I'll give you two, two second round picks for a first round, nothing, not a single trade. And then all of the trades that happened on day two were those like move up and down trades, like no, yeah. no real players, no trades involving players or anything. Well, uh, Red Wings got a couple guys for nothing. They were like salary dumps, right? They like, they got a pretty good player from. Uh, didn't they get who they get so, from? Uh, so yeah, they, they did, they did. But the point is, is that they were 
insignificant trades. Like if you're making a trade for literally nothing, which they did, it was for future considerations. Like that's an insignificant trade. That's a salary yeah. dump trade. That's a yeah. like, I need to get these guys off the books. Can you take them for me? Because you're a nice dude. Yes, right. I can. Yeah. So again, no trades of significance. Uh, lack of fans here in the building in Nashville. Mm -hmm. They're like the building was half empty. Now here's the thing. I in no way, shape or form blame the uh, city of Nashville or am looking at the uh, uh, passion of its fans in that. Like, I don't blame them at all. This is the first draft since I can remember that wasn't on a weekend. Well, so, wait, 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 wait. The Montreal was during the week last year. It was. It was. It, it was. was? Like a, yeah, it was like a third. I think the first night was a Thursday. And I think I, I can look it up. I'm, and then the second night was like a Friday and I flew home on Sunday. I think it was Thursday, Friday. And then everyone else went home Saturday and I stayed until Sunday. Because I remember um, I was on like a, a delayed flight with the associate coach of the Blue Jackets, Pascal Vincent, on a Sunday. And it was only a couple days uh, after the draft had ended. So it, at least the first night was a Thursday. Friday, you could yeah. say, is a, is a weekend. But that's the second day of the draft. So, yeah. So here uh, we are on a Wednesday night and uh, a, a Thursday morning uh, for the draft. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't blame any of that. But what I will say, because I went around and I like I was looking for fans in every jersey to see if I could find a fan from every jersey. Right. And I did talk to a lot of them. So many were from Atlanta. So oh, wow. many. Yeah. Like, I was shocked. They'd be like, they're like, oh, I'm from Atlanta. And one guy even showed me he had a Thrasher shirt underneath whatever jersey he was wearing. I don't even remember. Um, he's like, yeah, I'm still repping the Thrashers, but they're not here. So I figured I'd wear somebody else. And um, I was I was very, very impressed uh, to, to find um, so many hockey fans. And not even just from Atlanta, but, like, from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, so it just kind of shows that there is love for the NHL, uh, you know, in these uh, southern states. And uh, that the that the game is obviously growing. Um, and then I have uh, one more winner, and that is David Poyle. Uh, and I had yeah. it under the memorable moments, but I mean, it's he's he's also a winner. He's a huge fat winner to like kind of go out in this way and have this opportunity to truly be celebrated. Um, I, I know a lot of the GMs as they were making their first round picks were congratulating him on such an incredible career. He had 26 uh, years here in Nashville, um, over 40 years consecutively as an NHL executive uh, between here and with the Washington Capitals organization. Um, like just an incredible career. And then kudos to Tom Fitzgerald for um, he offered to trade the devil's uh, final pick in the draft, which is in the seventh round to Nashville um, so that David Poyle mm -hmm. could like officially make his last pick as a uh, general manager in the NHL and, and, um, uh, like just what a, what a moment for him. And the, the fun part for me personally is the other day, actually it was before round one, I went to the country music hall of fame. And as I was leaving, David Boyle was walking in. Really? <laughs> yes. And, and I saw him and I was like, oh my gosh. And so of course I have known David from um, obviously his work in Nashville, but also his work with USA Hockey. And I went over and I was just really grateful for the opportunity to shake his hand and just congratulate him on a tremendous career um, and, uh, uh, you know, thank him for always being so nice, you know, to right. to myself specifically um, and the conversations that we had had in the past. And it was even kind of funny afterwards, both he and Barry Trotz did um, a press conference after the first round and um, in which he talked about, you know, kind of the emotions of the night and, and whatnot like that. And um, he had, he obviously recognized me from the, from the morning and, you know, gave me a little wink of recognition. And uh, and then he tried BioSteel for the first time because <laughs> it was on the podiums and he was thirsty. He's like, can we drink these? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, yeah, I'm sure this? there for that reason. <laughs> there was, David Boyle uh, had not 
sampled BioSteel yet? Well, I don't know that he hadn't sampled it, but you know, like he picked one flavor, and and I said to him, the fl- the the players really like the fruit punch flavor, um, right. not the and but there was the fruit punch and the blue flavor, and um, so uh, I said, oh, the players really like the fruit punch flavor. He's like, oh, well, let me try that one. So we tried it. He's like, yeah, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, I agree with them. And it, actually, I had not tried BioSteel at all for a full year because remember they. They introduced that, I think, in Montreal last year at the draft. That that was a big change, like going from Gatorade as a sponsor to BioSteel. To, yeah. to BioSteel. And I had not it, – it was a it became a thing on the Blue Jackets beat because, like, you know, Jeff Foboda, who's the Blue Jackets insider, the uh, uh, writes for the team website, you know, he, he would, like, always get BioSteel, like, on the team flights and stuff. They would just, like, load it on there. And he's like, ah, oh, it's amazing. And they were, like – they were basically all, like, uh, uh, addicted to it, sort of. And I, I heard the opposite from people that tried it the first time, like, oh, this stuff's awful. So I just I had avoided it, and then they had it at the fridge, in the fridge, in the media uh, workroom at the um, the media hotel, or at the NHL hotel. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to try it. And so I did, I did try, I tried the uh, the fruit punch, and it was fantastic. It was really good. So I have to agree with David Poyle on that one. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. BioSteel is, is, I think it's delicious. And, you know, the fruit punch, the fruit punch is a plus yes. anyway um yeah, right, we are right. over our 45 minutes um i'm yeah. blaming you for not uh knowing about kyle davidson's man on the street interview but i do have two more points that uh, i want to make or three more points actually fun facts julie's fun facts i got three of them for you number one this is the fifth year a national team development program player was selected in the top five and that is the longest streak by any team in draft history Wow. To have one player. Granted, they're an anomaly because they are essentially an all-star team. Um, but still, kudos to them uh, for uh, the, the, the development that they're having. Number two, uh, there were seven Slovakian players selected this year. The first uh, the, or the highest was Dalibor Dvorsky. Um, but Adam Gayan who was the goaltender at the World Junior Championship. I don't know if you were paying attention, but Dang, what a story this guy had. He was playing in the national, excuse me, he was playing in the North American Hockey League. There was an injury to the to the uh, one of the goalies uh-huh. uh, for Team Slovakia, and they needed another goalie to, to bring to the tournament and um, expecting this guy, Adam, to be uh, a third uh, string goalie. But he was yeah. in North America, so it was convenient to like get him to the tournament in Halifax. And he ended up taking over the number one spot for Team Slovakia. He was incredible. Um, So uh, kudos to Adam Guyon. It it was funny because we had this conversation because he's 19, so he had already been through the draft twice. And um, uh, this was, uh, or at least once, I don't know if it was twice. I don't know when his actual birthday is. Um, Anyways, yeah, kudos to him. He was selected 35th by the Chicago Blackhawks. And what's funny is at the combine, he said to Connor Bedard, because Gunnar scored a sick goal against him <laughs> at the World Juniors. And he's like, Yeah, maybe um, in the future we'll be on the same team and you can only score on me in practice. Uh, and, and then, look and now happened. that's a possibility. And then yeah. the, the third point I want to make is there were 14 non-North American players selected in the first round. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's nearly half of the players. So, again, it's a global game. I love seeing it grow. Uh, you know, as proud as I am to be American and have, you know, quality American players, and I'm sure for Canadians as well, um, you know, just knowing how the game is growing and that all of these other countries and the development that they're, um, you know, investing in is paying off. I love all of that. All right. I'm going to give you a final word, but then we got to wrap it up. You're just going to give me the final word. Yeah. What, whatever you want to throw in before we, we turn this. Mm. I don't think I have a final word. I think you've I summed it. it pretty well. I think I'm good to go. All right. Mm. Well, sounds give good. The car horn. Give me the car horn. Ah. I'm not prepared. That's a goal horn. I'm not prepared. I'll I'll put that in later. (laughs) All right. So for Brian Hedger, I'm Julie Robenheimer. Thank you so much for watching episode one of Not Your Normal Hockey Show. We'll see you next time.
See ya. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and don't forget to leave us a comment, drop a like, hit that subscribe button, and share this episode with your friends. I'm going to show you again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, team! <laughs> yeah. you, you are why this is not your normal hockey show. Yeah, well, I think it's both of us, you know, but mainly me. Yeah. Yes, mostly. Because I'm not normal.